It's 11 o'clock in Washington, 4 o'clock GMT, and 7.30 p.m. in Bangalore. I am delighted that you've joined us for this very special interview of Larry Steinman, a truly distinguished scientist and a great friend of mine who I'm privileged to uh, to know. And I thought this would be a great opportunity to allow Larry to teach you what he has taught me uh, over the past few years. Larry is a multifaceted person, and I think you'll get a sense of that as we, we go along. I won't try to introduce Larry. Uh, that would take a long time. In the um, invitation that you received to attend the meeting, you'll find some information about Larry, but uh, it's not exhaustive. He has a long list of accomplishments. Now, this will be conversational. We don't want to get into the weeds of data. In fact, we have a very diverse group, and Larry is a, um, a great teacher. He will uh, attempt to avoid jargon and uh, technical terms that may not be recognized by people who are not immunologists. This will be, I believe, an opportunity to learn a lot of different things, and uh, you'll soon find out what they are. Just a few housekeeping items. Let me ask you all to mute your phones during the course of the talk. We may have some time at the end for questions. I would ask you to indicate that you have a question using the uh, provision in the webcast uh, menu offering that you'll see on the left on the right hand side of your screen and as you have a question just write your name or write the question uh, you don't have to write your name that will be uh, done automatically but uh, do write your question and I will either put it to Larry uh, at that point or, or at the end of the of the uh, of the talk Without further ado, Larry, thank you so much for joining us. It's a little early out on the West Coast, but um, you're an early riser, so we're delighted you're with us. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Yes, the sun is up here in California. I'm at on the Stanford campus, and uh, I uh, welcome this opportunity to talk to you. I, I do want to comment that two things. One is I hope you uh, will the listening audience uh, send in questions? Uh, cogent comments or questions are fine. If they're very complex and you don't think uh, it's worthwhile in this short uh, hour that we have, send me an email. I answer them. And uh, my past experience with the audience at Connexum is that they're uh, very educational. My uh, students, so to speak, and I know uh, almost all of you are experts, are my best teachers. So uh, we're all students and teachers. Well, Larry, we want to, uh, or I, I want our audience to get to know you. And one thing that has struck me in many of your talks is that you often speak about your parents. And that's a very poignant beginning for a number of your lectures. And here we see a, a picture of your dad and mom and uh, your father as an early influence in the career that you took. Well, thank you very much. I was very fortunate to have uh, two uh, highly intelligent parents who valued uh, creativity and education. Uh, my father and mother met uh, at a very young age. He was a uh, math major at NYU, and uh, she was a student at Hunter College. She became a teacher. Uh, my father, uh, after World War II, wanted to go to med school. That road was uh, blocked, uh, so we went to uh, pharmacy school. And I spent a lot of time, uh, not, not uh, fully willing, because I would have rather been kicking a ball or throwing a ball. And uh, he, I had to be a stock boy and do a lot of uh, things in the pharmacy. But as it turns out, I may have uh, 
uh, had some inspiration from all those pharmaceuticals on the shelf behind him in that picture. You grew up in an exciting time, transitional in many ways, and you might just talk about uh, those early years where you got interested in science. Right. Uh, well, uh, the time and the location one uh, grows up in is very important. It was uh, after uh, the World War, <clears throat> it was uh, before the Vietnam War, and then uh, remarkably, because of the Russians sending up Sputnik, our country went into uh, a great sense of urgency to make sure that uh, we caught up to the Russians in science. And there's uh, JFK. Uh, JFK had a, a wonderful science advisor, Jerome Wiesner, during that period of time. Because of Russia, uh, they would have National Science Foundation uh, camps at uh, Land Grant University. So I was sent for a whole summer up to Corvallis, Oregon, to Oregon State University, where we learned Fortran programming and Boolean algebra and uh, a variety of uh, mathematical uh, specialties that weren't available in a normal uh, junior high or high school. It turned out that the group of about 50 of us at that one location, and there were many locations, uh, many of them turned out uh, to be professors of physics or mathematics all over the country. Many of them became <clears throat> deans of science faculties. And I think about our situation uh, now and the de-emphasis of uh, science budgets and the uh, lack of uh, a scientific uh, advisor to uh, our uh, chief executive in the White House. And uh, it causes uh, more than a little bit con of concern and despair, but those were golden times. I was lucky. Well, you went east from your native California and even east from um, the uh, East Coast. You were associated with a number of distinguished uh, institutions of learning and research. Right, I, <clears throat> this is sort of the, the menu I wanted to do something completely different than my uh, background in Southern California. So I went to uh, Hanover, New Hampshire to Dartmouth. I studied uh, physics there. Then it was Harvard Medical School. Uh, then off to Stanford for uh, residency uh, training in pediatrics and neurology. I interrupted that with a postdoctoral fellowship over in Israel at the Weizmann Institute. And uh, I've been at Stanford for the last uh, 38 years on the faculty, so it's been the only job of my adult life. That picture in the uh, lower right is the uh, beautiful drive to the uh, front of the campus, and in the background is the church and then the, the foothills. You can see a radio telescope there on one of the first small hills, and we often... Uh, hike, walk, jog up there uh, almost every day just for the exercise and the view of the San Francisco Bay. So it's been a very uh, fortunate uh, educational experience and I'm still getting educated. And along the way, um, I, I've had some fantastic teachers and experiences. So when uh, Stanford in the uh, 1970s and 80s, when I was uh, a resident and junior faculty was an exceptionally dynamic place. It still is, but there was sort of a pioneering spirit. The school had come down from San Francisco. We're on the peninsula, and I was surrounded by uh, senior individuals like Ray Hintz in endocrinology. My office was right next to uh, the endocrinology office, which kind of makes sense because the, the brain is one of the commanders of the endocrine system, though the endocrinologists would say the endocrine system is one of the commanders of the brain. And uh, that's debatable. But Ray uh, and I came together because there was a, a patient uh, that was getting growth hormone. He was interested in short stature and there was the short stature clinic. And this individual started uh, having elements of uh, dementia at uh, a very young age. And uh, Ray said, we better have the child neurologists come over. So this was the whole uh, beginning of uh, the, the finding that uh, Ray uh, catalyzed that uh, the delivery of human growth hormone from 
uh, animals was uh, leading to the transmission of what we now know as a, a prion disease. And uh, of course, this problem was obviated uh, uh, from the ability to genetically engineer uh, growth hormone. But uh, Ray was a terrific uh, leader and he spawned uh, many of the colleagues that are, are still on the faculty and that I collaborate with, uh, Daryl Wilson, the head of our uh, diabetes group, uh, is an advisor to uh, a company that we'll tell you about a little later on. But uh, Ray was terrific. His daughter is actually a professor of uh, pediatrics in the neonatology unit at the Children's Hospital. And Larry, you taught me this story, which uh, for an endocrinologist, I should have already known about the particular index case that Ray discovered. Uh, and this came about when we both discussed, you and I were talking about our interest early on in our careers in muscular dystrophy, Duchenne's in particular. I, as a medical student, was using growth hormone under the, uh, or working with Dan Rudman in those very early days to try to help people with muscular dystrophy. Of course, it didn't really work, but uh, it turned out that Emory, where I was, was the, uh, um, the center for isolating growth hormone from pituitary glands. And I can tell you that it was a pretty dirty business and um, I'm not maybe surprisingly uh, we had this terrible problem with uh, CJD. Fortunately, at that time, recombinant uh, growth hormone uh, came to the fore. It was the second biotech drug approved by FDA. And um, it was very important that Ray uh, spoke up very, very early on. He actually received a lot of criticism from uh, my colleagues. And it turned out that he saved lives by making that early observation. Yes. Look at turn. Yeah, go ahead. It, it's so fortunate that uh, Art Riggs' uh, fabulous technology for uh, making uh, genetically engineered um, hormones uh, just hit. Otherwise, we would have been in a, uh, an even worse situation. But uh, Quite fascinating. By the way, a book that I'm sure most of you are familiar with, The Nobel Duel between Shally and Guimano on uh, getting enough material to purify some of the first um, stimulating um, factors before the, the age of cloning the genes. Uh, it turns out to be a great read. It's Nicholas Wade, The Noble Duel, worth reading in your abundant spare time when you're not listening to the gruesome uh, minute by minute news from Washington. <laughs> well, a great recommendation. Well, let's go on to talk about where you really have blazed a trail in, in the field of immunology. And it wasn't just theoretical discoveries. You really uh, ended up being a, a, a very major figure in the development of an important uh, therapy. Now, Elizamab, uh, better known now as Tysabri. This was a great discovery. Tell us a little bit about it and uh, how you ultimately saw this product get on the market. Right. Well, there's a number of uh, comments, and it leads to uh, what the title of this uh, morning session is about big hammers versus lasers. And uh, we'll have to think about what we mean by a laser and what we mean by a big hammer. A big hammer could be something as laser-like as a monoclonal antibody, but if its mechanism of action is broad, it can act as a big hammer. So the idea behind this research, which started at, at about 1990 and was done in collaboration uh, with a colleague Ted Yednock at a uh, biotechnology company uh, known as Athena at the time, was to discover whether there were specific uh, routing uh, codes that would tell an immune cell, go to the brain, go to the intestine, uh, go to the eye, and might uh, be the basis for uh, why there is organ-specific autoimmune diseases. Uh, we had called this the zip code uh, hypothesis for lymphocyte homing, but uh, I'm afraid uh, zip code was already uh, used 
uh, elegantly and in, in a way that changed science by Gunter Blobel. So we'll have to think of a, a better uh, way of describing this homing. So what we found was that uh, the immune cells that home to the central nervous system use a particular integrin. These are uh, Velcro-like molecules that stick the lymphocyte onto the endothelium. And the uh, targeting mole mm -hmm. uh, targeting uh, integrin pair, an integrin has an alpha and a beta chain, it was alpha-4, beta-1 integrin. And if you block that, you could stop uh, disease in an animal model of MS and an MS itself very profoundly. The lymphocytes did not enter the central nervous system. Uh, that had consequences, as uh, we'll see uh, in, in a second. But uh, there are various zip codes. Uh, homing to, uh, intestines is by alpha-4, beta-7. So uh, there are actually two uh, approved drugs at the present time involving uh, integrin blockade. One is uh, natalizumab, which works for uh, homing to the uh, brain and the central, uh, to the brain and the central nervous system, spinal cord, but also to the intestine. And natalizumab is approved for uh, inflammatory bowel disease and for MS, whereas uh, there's a drug, vedaluzumab, uh, made by Takeda. Its uh, trade name is Antevio, and that targets alpha-4, beta-7. That doesn't work at all in MS, but it works uh, quite well in IBD. So we really do have a zip code. So uh, here in the next slide that uh, Zan has projected, uh, in a mere uh, 12 years from uh, reporting alpha-4, beta-1 in uh, the preclinical studies, there was a, a phase three trial uh, that showed a dramatic reduction in the relapse rate in multiple sclerosis. And on the basis of uh, one year of data in a two-year trial, the FDA uh, approved natalizumab the day after Thanksgiving in 2004. So people should uh, be aware that the FDA can move uh, quickly and boldly, and they were doing so uh, even 14 uh, years ago. But look what happened three months later in the, in the next slide. Uh, cases of uh, progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy were seen, three of them, uh, two in MS uh, patients and one in a patient with uh, Crohn's disease. Remember, this drug was being tested for two diseases. And on the morning of uh, March 1st, 2005, uh, uh, the New York Times and the, the news services reported that because of these deaths, uh, Biogen was withdrawing the uh, drug known as Tysavri natalizumab from the market. Uh, but this wasn't the end of the story. A couple of points. Uh, along the way, we had tested alpha-4, beta-1 blockade uh, in other uh, potential uh, target diseases like diabetes, and my opinion was that this drug is, was potentially dangerous, which turned out to be true, because although it's a monoclonal antibody, which some people might call, well, that's a laser, a monoclonal antibody, its dynamic action is to block homing to a whole swath of tissue and uh, leaving uh, that particular target site uh, open to opportunistic infections. So the drug came back. It's, it was a good story of resilience. Patients demanded it back. The FDA installed a very uh, tough um, screening system uh, and able to get the drug. It's called the TOUCH program. But along the way, a risk mitigating biomarker uh, was shown to have exceptional uh, specificity. So 50%, 5-0, percent of the patients are excluded by this uh, biomarker. The biomarker is very sensible. If you uh, have antibodies to the virus, JC virus, that causes PML, then uh, you would uh, be at risk for the disease. If you don't have antibodies, the uh, presumption is you may not uh, be infected with JC virus. And people who are uh, antibody negative uh, do not get uh, PM PML. There have been about 170,000 people who have taken 
uh, Tysabri, Natalizumab thus far. So um, a very interesting series of observations that I want to emphasize. It took uh, a decade to go from bench to bedside to approved drug. Uh, the FDA moved fast to approve the drug, and then it backfired because the drug had to be removed from the market. And then it came back again by a sensible decision by the regulatory agencies with a very severe uh, regulatory program for being able to get the drug. And then a risk mitigation test comes along that uh, wipes out half of the potential market. We'll talk about commercial uh, implications in a second. But then more people take the drug because uh, it's efficacious and they can uh, rest assured that it's safe. So there's a lot of um, important take home lessons uh, from the Ty Sabri story. It's still on the market <clears throat> selling as a, uh, a significant blockbuster. Um, I had another chapter in drug development, which is also uh, illuminating. So uh, for reasons that had more to do with uh, being at the right place at the right time, the founders of uh, Centicor asked me to join their board of directors early in the history of the company. And one of the drugs that uh, came from uh, those efforts in the company <clears throat> was the development of uh, infliximab, Remicade, uh, by Centicor. It, the uh, drug and the company was eventually acquired by Johnson & Johnson. Uh, the main driver of the anti-TNF uh, were two scientists over in England, a rheumatologist, uh, Tiny Maney, and an immunologist, uh, Mark Feldman. But uh, Remicade uh, really uh, revolutionized the whole uh, use of uh, antibodies to cytokines, particularly in this case, tumor necrosis factor for treatment of rheumatologic diseases. There's an interesting comment I should make. Senecor uh, was in deep financial trouble uh, during the early development of Remicade. And uh, to uh, save the ship from sinking, uh, two companies, Sharing Plow now uh, uh, owned by Merck and uh, uh, Eli Lilly uh, were given rights to uh, two of the most advanced product in exchange for handsome uh, royalties. And uh, it was a toss of the coin. Eli Lilly won the toss and they got to choose between uh, Reapro, a very uh, effective drug to block restenosis. It also uh, targets an integrin or this other drug uh, called infliximab. And uh, the commercial people at Lilly uh, saw no future for an anti-TNF in the rheumatologic diseases. They thought that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories were serving the market well. So they chose Reapro having won the toss. Uh, the second choice went to Sharing Plow and they got uh, Remicade. So Merck gets a significant uh, royalty stream <clears throat> on Remicade <clears throat> from uh, Johnson & Johnson who now owns it. But um, I think Yogi Berra said this best about commercial uh, projections when there's no uh, standard in the field that it's very tough to predict the future. So uh, you might want to bring Yogi Berra into uh, discussions of uh, commercial potential of drugs where there has been no uh, significant drug before. One other comment I wanted to make about uh, Remicade and uh, the uh, title on this slide is Again, back to the idea of big hammers. Uh, the big hammers are, uh, again, uh, laser-like in some ways because Remicade is a monoclonal antibody just to TNF, and Tysabri is a monoclonal antibody just to alpha-4 integrin. But the second line here is one size does not fit all. And uh, in this uh, review piece that I wrote with Joan Merrill, uh, Ian McInnes, and Mark Peekman, uh, it turns out that uh, I was involved in experiments giving uh, anti-TNF uh, to multiple sclerosis patients, <clears throat> and it made MS patients worse, in fact. Uh, there's a label on the approved drug <clears throat> for rheumatoid arthritis saying, do not give to anyone with demyelinating disease because it is known to make it worse. So here's anti-TNF, uh, a brilliant drug for rheumatologic diseases and inflammatory bowel disease and psoriasis. And uh, it carries a warning label that it will make MS worse. 
Uh, the underlying science behind why that happens is quite uh, fascinating, but uh, it emphasizes that one size does not fit all, even when you're dealing with an antibody to what we all think is an inflammatory <laughs> cytokine. Well, that led to a kind of <clears throat> fork in the road in your your research, Larry, and I was stunned by the coincidence that you wrote an editorial that takes off on Robert Frost's famous poem uh, that you applied to the pursuit of antigen-specific therapy. Right. And so this is go right ahead. Yeah, so I mean, all along, while uh, antibodies that would uh, target the zip code and block homing uh, was uh, being pursued in my lab and in others, um, I've always been attracted to the idea of uh, let's do antigen specific therapy, let's tolerize the immune system to that specific antigen or antigens that is involved in an autoimmune disease. And um, poetry is a good way of uh, showing science. It's uh, a lot prettier than looking at Western blots or uh, DNA sequences. Uh, so this poem by Frost, Two Roads Diverge in a Wood, everyone, it's, it's actually, um, as far as Google hits, uh, uh, the most uh, widely read poem uh, in uh, the English uh, language. And uh, it, it's a magnificent poem. Take a look at it uh, sometime over the weekend. Um, says a lot. A couple of other things about there's Robert Frost with uh, um, out on his uh, farm in New Hampshire. And um, it's the 100th <clears throat> anniversary of the poem uh, this year. It's also about the 100th anniversary of another uh, famous uh, discovery, uh, Banting and Best's discovery of insulin about 100 years ago. So um, this is an auspicious time to <clears throat> get into the issue of uh, antigen-specific therapy. So uh, just to put this in a uh, graphic form, uh, if you go to uh, the Cotswolds, uh, you'll see where Jenner, in the end of uh, the 1700s, uh, learn that uh, there's a cross-reactive antigen on uh, cowpox and smallpox, and he uh, injected his uh, son um, after observing that uh, milkmaids, the uh, women who milked the cows, uh, had um, very unblemished skin because they didn't get smallpox. So he, came, he revolutionized uh, the whole world of immunology. The word vaccination comes from vaca, cow, and uh, vaccination is highly antigen specific. If we get a polio immunization, we're immune to polio. It doesn't uh, shut down any other part of the immune system. Um, the same with the pertussis or tetanus vaccination. So the idea here is what if somebody were able to pull off the feat of throwing an off switch rather than an on switch? And uh, for want of a better term, uh, I, I tried inverse vaccination. I don't think it's uh, caught on very well uh, yet. But the whole idea is uh, if people are smart enough, uh, as Jenner was, to realize there's uh, the possibility of antigen-specific uh, immunity. Let's see if we can get antigen-specific tolerance. And you've had a lot to do with characterizing the... Uh, cellular interactions that uh, result in this immune tolerance. And maybe you could walk us through conceptually what the difference is between activating the immune system and inducing it to tolerate an antigen. Right. Uh, thank you. So the uh, way that uh, an antigen is recognized by a T cell is uh, intricate. And uh, there's the receptor. If you look at the uh, green cell uh, over on the right side of this cartoon, uh, it recognizes an antigen that is in a uh, molecule called the histocompatibility molecule. So that's the basic recognition step, but it requires co-stimulatory molecules. 
Now, co-stimulatory molecules are front and center in oncology these days. The revolution uh, from ipilimumab, uh, pembrolizumab, these are all drugs that are blocking co-stimulatory molecules and unleashing the immune system so that we can kill a melanoma or a small cell lung carcinoma. The price we pay uh, for getting to survive is often autoimmune disease, inflammatory bowel disease, type 1 diabetes, hypophysitis, diseases that were never seen. So co-stimulation is uh, critical uh, for unleashing the immune system. It's also critical for uh, keeping uh, us in a state of tolerance. So the idea here was to develop a therapy that would have the virtue of antigen-specific tolerance, but would not affect the immune system globally. So again, the immuno-oncology revolution, they don't care because it, you need uh, to do whatever you can at the present time to uh, unleash the immune system and survive your tumor. So they uh, knock down the inhibitory co-stimulatory molecules. Our idea was in a highly antigen-specific way to reinforce the inhibitory co-stimulatory molecules. One last thing about this cartoon, uh, it was based on thinking from both Mark Feldman and me. Mark, again, I mentioned him earlier. He was the uh, co-inventor of anti-TNF therapy. So uh, we've been thinking about this uh, for a long time and trying to pull it off in the clinic. And we'll share some data uh, shortly about uh, some initial success in the clinic uh, with this idea. And so, Larry, there are two strands to this uh, story uh, in terms of how one might induce uh, tolerance. And um, maybe you could talk a bit about these papers, and we'll get to a more conceptual representation on the next slide. Right. And I apologize. Uh, for this slide, it's about as exciting as looking at a Western blot. So I'm just going to make two points about this uh, slide, and then we'll move on to a cartoon, which is more fun. So again, uh, this is two-pronged. We're trying to do antigen-specific tolerance, and we're trying to uh, enforce the inhibitory checkpoints, but to do it in an antigen-specific way. And I'll show you in a cartoon, but there's one number on uh, this slide that I just want to call attention to. So uh, on the left, there's a paper, Journal of Immunology, 1999. So I, I say this for a very important reason, that drug development uh, has a very slow clock. Here we are, 2018, and uh, we're in the clinic, we're making progress, uh, but look how long it takes. So when we see the arguments, and they're very cogent, uh, my classmate Jerry Avorn is uh, one of the champions, why do drugs cost so much? Why does the pharmaceutical industry charge so much? Uh, they're all uh, points of uh, valid discussion, but one thing to keep in mind is, uh, besides the risk of uh, dry wells when you're trying to develop a new drug, uh, you might, uh, using that analogy, dig a well with high expectations and find out that you're not on, on an oil pocket, uh, you can have a failed drug. But uh, clinical development is slow, it's expensive, and it's very time consuming. Uh, Ty Sabri, I mentioned, was about 10 to 12 years from bench to bedside. Antigen-specific tolerance uh, has even so far a longer uh, time uh, line in coming from the bench. We hope uh, that this will uh, rapidly change, but it's uh, really something to remember. Now back to the cartoons. Uh, so we, in our particular way, and there are many ways to attempt antigen-specific tolerance, uh, we are trying to uh, modulate those co-stimulatory molecules, and then, and it will be uh, more clear in the in the next slide, but uh, we're changing not only the adaptive immune system, but the innate immune system. So it turns out that there are uh, a set of molecules that stimulate uh, the immune system on a more fundamental level called the innate immune system. So we're trying to, again, have the precision of uh, modulating the response to one and only one antigen that's shown on the left. 
And part of the uh, sauce of the recipe is to make sure that uh, we've toned down the uh, innate immune system. So I'll share with you what this CPG to GPG means in the next slide. Well, we may have lost that slide, Larry. I'm Okay, uh, let's go. Let's go back. Uh, okay, I, we have we have lost. So, uh, what what we've done is uh, created a circular uh, DNA uh, molecule. It's called a plasmid, and the DNA plasmid has a coding region. Uh, in the case of uh, different autoimmune diseases, we're going to try to tolerize to different antigens. And the backbone of the DNA contains uh, what used to be called junk sequences, non-coding DNA. It turns out that there are particular motifs within non-coding DNA called CPG motifs. They have a particular DNA sequence. And it was discovered that uh, these sequences, there are six nucleotides, trigger a specific receptor called uh, TLR9. And these toll-like receptors were discovered in the immune system by Bruce Beutler, uh, who uh, shared a Nobel Prize uh, for it. So we've engineered this plasmid so that uh, it encodes the antigen that we want to tolerize to, as well as changing the backbone so that these hexanucleotides are no longer there. So uh, let's take a look at how we can use this particular technology, and that's shown in the next slide. So uh, if you're going to try antigen-specific therapy, it would be good to uh, try it in diseases where we actually understand the pathophysiology well enough to uh, direct this type of attempt uh, with an antigen-specific DNA plasmid. Others are doing it with uh, nanoparticles. Uh, but you want to go after diseases where we know the antigen. So uh, this is a fruit tree, and there's the uh, various uh, levels of high and low-hanging fruit. But some of the diseases where we know best, the lowest-hanging fruit is type 1 diabetes, the disease uh, affecting only one cell in the body primarily uh, under immune attack. And we have a pretty good handle on what the antigens are. On this uh, fruit tree, just to share with you, uh, the autoimmune skin disease, pemphigus vulgaris, the antigen is desmoglein 3, myasthenia gravis, the neurologic disease, the antigen is nicotinic acetylcholine receptor, neuromyelitis optica, it's a water channel, aquaporin 4, and Graves' disease, it's actually an agonistic stimulatory antibody to TSH receptor. One other thing on this tree, and we'll get to at the uh, end of uh, uh, this uh, talk, is uh, gene therapy, which is uh, perhaps uh, one of the most well-defined uh, points. You replace a protein uh, either via a gene or a recombinant protein for a molecule that uh, the human body never made uh, hemophilia A, the human body never made uh, factor eight in its full form. And you give uh, wild type native factor eight to an individual with hemophilia A, and often they'll develop uh, blocking antibodies to the clotting factor. And uh, we should be able to tolerate there. We know exactly the antigen, and we know exactly when time zero is of the uh, immune response to the newly delivered antigens when therapy actually starts. So type 1 diabetes is uh, what uh, we're going after. And I should mention that uh, there's a uh, privately held company that uh, Zan and I are both uh, actively involved in. Zan is the uh, CEO. I as a, a co-founder and board member in uh, I'm not here to uh, pitch the company. I'm just uh, telling you what we're doing. Um, we're trying to tolerize the immune system uh, to one of the main drivers of type 1 diabetes, the pro-insulin uh, molecule. Again, there's a picture of a young person, uh, the beta cell, uh, 
The beta cell is under autoimmune attack, and uh, one of the main drivers of that autoimmunity is an immune response to pro-insulin. So what we're trying to do is tolerize to pro-insulin using this circular DNA plasmid uh, that uh, encodes pro-insulin. Uh, and here, here we have the, the picture uh, in uh, the, the round plasmid is double-stranded circular DNA. The red region uh, is the non-coding region. It has those CPGs removed and the GPGs installed. Uh, in the coding region, we have pro-insulin. We take out the leader sequence. We don't want it secreted uh, and functioning as autonomous insulin. And we give it by intramuscular injection about once a week. Uh, the injection is meant to be the reverse of a Janarian uh, vaccination. It's supposed to be non-stimulatory, non-inflammatory. Um, and uh, we don't want the protein uh, leaking out, so it's non-secretory. And we've taken, we cured a lot of mice uh, with this approach, and we've taken it into uh, 80, 80 patients uh, in an uh, early stage um, development program where we followed patients for up to three years, but the period of exposure to the drug was 12 weekly injections. We started out with uh, adults with type 1 diabetes and actually not so recently diagnosed, but they had to have uh, still be making uh, insulin as measured by C peptide. We tried various doses. It was placebo controlled. And uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, you can see something very unexpected happened. It was done as a safety trial, but during the period of exposure, we actually were seeing more insulin being produced by the beta cells. And uh, we also saw a fall in the uh, hemoglobin A1C. But the implications and the excitement of uh, this finding was, does that mean that beta cells that were under attack are able, once you tolerize the immune system, uh, can they start uh, functioning uh, normally? Number two, were there dormant beta cells that uh, came back to life with uh, our attempt to tolerize? And number three, uh, is there actually regeneration going on? We don't have the answers to those questions, but we're so uh, intrigued by these results that um, we've received um, investment uh, funding and we're going to move this ahead to a pivotal trial. Now, I mentioned uh, we're trying to do antigen-specific tolerance so I want to say something about those types of trials. I'm not going to tell you all the details of these graphs, just the take home message. And the work was published in Science Translational Medicine. But here the idea was, remember, we want to do an inverse vaccination. We want to shut down the response against the precursor of insulin. But we don't want to affect the immune response to measles or cytomegalovirus or Epstein-Barr virus. So uh, when you're doing a clinical trial, there's the primary approvable FDA recognized endpoints. But I always uh, uh, emphasize that you should bolt on to clinical trials the most cutting edge science possible. So we collaborated with uh, Professor Bart Rope, uh, then at Leiden University, uh, now at City of Hope. Uh, where he uh, heads a, a very big uh, type 1 diabetes unit. And uh, Bart has a toolkit which enabled us to show that we were achieving antigen-specific tolerance. We were leaving viral immunity intact. And the only uh, thing we were doing was reducing the immune response to uh, pro-insulin. So again, that uh, puts a lot of wind behind our sails as we move ahead to the next trial. But uh, if you're going to try antigen-specific tolerance, it's uh, very important to prove that you're attaining it. So uh, this gets back to uh, the uh, fruit tree, where uh, I want to talk uh, finally about uh, gene therapy to say a few words about uh, how we're also applying this uh, approach um, of antigen-specific tolerance with a uh, circular plasmid, or we're uh, tolerizing to the delivered gene product. So the next slide 
uh, emphasizes the uh, problems that the gene therapy field uh, encounters, I'll say from time to time, but it's uh, certainly uh, an issue. Uh, if you're going to deliver a protein that an individual's immune system has never seen, that protein may likely be recognized as foreign and uh, rejected or uh, responded to just as we might respond to the foreign protein from a mosquito bite. So we see uh, this press release from a week ago from a, a, a very uh, uh, able startup company, uh, Solid, in their uh, clinical trial that they were put on clinical hold due to immune responses. They're trying to deliver a short version of the muscular dystrophy gene uh, called microdystrophin uh, to uh, boys with this disease, and they've run into um, immune problems because of the uh, fact that the microdystrophin uh, has sequences that th these boys have never seen, uh, so they're getting an immune response. So uh, we've been working on tolerizing actually to microdystrophin, and uh, I think the next slide just shows some of our uh, results. The next slide is a cartoon. Again, it emphasizes that uh, you will get bit by this for foreign protein that you're try trying to replace unless you can tolerize. And over on the side of the slide, I mentioned a few diseases like Duchenne's and factor eight, where you really uh, might want to seriously consider tolerization. And the, the next slide, and I believe it's uh, one of the last data slides, uh, just shows you that uh, we were able to uh, construct a circular DNA plasmid and in a uh, mouse model of uh, Duchenne dystrophy where there's a deletion in the dystrophin uh, protein. We were able to reduce anti-dystrophin immunity. That's what you're seeing in that heat map off to the left. But most importantly, when we did uh, measurements of muscle strength, when we uh, were able to abrogate the immune response, the muscle strength uh, was increased. So the idea is that uh, tolerization in this uh, new age where gene therapy is really coming to life will be an important adjunct to enable uh, successful gene replacement therapy. So that's another uh, very positive use of uh, this technology. Well, Larry, that is a wonderful tour of uh, science and a remarkable uh, career and uh, with with art and letters thrown in we we end up back on the campus of Stanford and I'm going to let you tell a uh, a little story about the university in a moment I, I'll just uh, let everybody know that they should uh, anybody who wants to answer or ask a question uh, either raise your hand by the uh, the uh, web device, or we'll throw it open in a moment and see what happens and hope it's not too chaotic. But I was noticing uh, and reviewing a, a license the other day that the university is officially referred to as the Leland Stanford Junior University. And I thought, my gosh, I always thought of Stanford as a pretty good uh uh, full university, and uh, in fact, uh, there is an explanation. You might talk about the founding of Stanford and and what the junior comes from. Right. Well, Leland Stanford was governor of California and uh, one of the uh, financiers of the Trans Pacific R Railroad. He had a beloved uh, son who was on a trip through uh, Europe and uh, died of uh, typhoid. So the university was created. Uh, in his memory uh, around the uh, turn of the century. That's how it got the name Junior University. Uh, as uh, some people know, we have uh, very good uh, sports teams and uh, some very good uh, professors. Yesterday, the uh, former president of the university won the Turing Prize uh, for computer science. It's the Nobel Prize in computing. John Hennessy won it and his his uh, development was an algorithm called uh, RISC uh, for making uh, the modern chips. And RISC is an acronym for reduced information on the chip, which reminds me of the whole principle of keep it simple 
And uh, if you keep things simple, um, I would contend that uh, if all goes well, a uh, simple DNA plasmid encoding an antigen with uh, certain bells and whistles attached may fit into that idea of uh, let's reduce the information and try to tolerize the immune system. Anyway, uh, it's been a fabulous place to spend four decades on this campus. Well, Larry, uh, we do have a question actually from a, uh, near, a neighbor up uh, uh, near Berkeley, another distinguished campus, uh, Todd Lorenz. Go right ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Zan. Uh, Larry, nice to, very, very fascinating uh, presentation. In particular, your clinical data is provocative and clearly needs to be followed up with a pivotal trial as soon as possible. But what I was wondering was, going back before you had that data, there are certainly a number of antibodies that are associated with type 1 diabetes. I was wondering what attracted your attention specifically to the pro-insulin autoantibody. Right, thank you. It's a great question. Um, I, I would like in the uh, version 2, version 3, version 4 to tolerize to all of the known antigens, glutamic acid decarboxylate, zinc transporter, at the top of the pyramid, most people think that, uh, especially in children, the uh, initial driver is pro-insulin. Uh, there's also an interrelatedness between uh, once you break tolerance to one antigen, it could spread to the others. But your point's very well taken. Ultimately, what we would like to see, what would make the drug uh, most sensible is if you happen to be a pro-insulin responder, we'll tolerize to that. If you happen to be a GAD responder, we'll tolerize to that. If you happen to respond to both, we'll tolerize to both. But uh, your question is very well taken and it's something I certainly expect from somebody living near Berkeley. They always throw in the tough question. <laughs> very good. Uh, next, um, we have, uh, was that a follow-up, Todd? Go ahead. No, no, uh, I didn't have a Okay, well. Thanks. Uh, let's go to Thomas Sir, uh, the CEO of Connexon. You have a very good question, Thomas. Sorry, I muted. Can you hear me? Yes, and I, I can read your I can read your question. If the FDA had not approved early and deaths were reported, would Ty Sabri have seen the light of day? Good That's question. it. Probably not. Uh, likewise, if uh, Remicade had first been tested in MS, it may never have seen the light of day in rheumatologic diseases. Uh, there's a lot of luck involved in all of this, isn't there? Yeah, it's not for the uh, reasons, the scientific reasons, but there are lots of other reasons, luck in the history, the actual order of events that uh, could uh, determine history. I guess that's ge a general observation about history, and it applies to drug development as well. That's right. Uh, can I ask a question uh, towards uh, arthritis autoimmunity? Sure. That's a, a shock. I, yes. I believe. Yeah, go right ahead. Uh, my question is, hello, my question is, I have been working in, worked in FDA for a long time uh, in autoimmune diseases and you know the TNA products and other IL-17 and many other uh, anti-arthritic drugs I reviewed. My question is in other area of autoimmunity, as you said, uh, that for the GI Crohn's disease and also Tisabri, for example, they have the integrin as the site for uh, immune suppression development. Now, why same type of progress is not made towards the uh, joint autoimmunity, which is the rheumatoid arthritis? That's what I was wondering because when the uh, when the uh, Crohn's disease last approval for I believe for Takeda, uh, it was clearly stated that it is a gut specific integrin which will not touch the same immune suppression to the other sites of the body, and uh, th uh, that was the thinking for the approval. Now for arthritis, we have not come across a a very selective and and specific uh, integrin subtypes. Uh, that's my question, General. Well, in answer to that question, uh, the uh, positioning, the zip code, so to speak, 
may involve more than integrins, and uh, there may, it may be a combination of integrins and chemokines and other uh, types of uh, carbohydrate molecules. So it's certainly an area of active investigation. Another uh, issue in uh, rheumatoid arthritis, what is the uh, antigen that's driving it? So there's a lot of candidate antigens, but one of the most significant developments is that there's a post-translational modification, citrullination, uh, that, that seems to be uh, very dominant among um, the immune responses that are targeting uh, these joint antigens. So there are actually uh, programs to try to uh, inhibit uh, the citrullination step. Uh, there are programs that uh, are trying to tolerize to the citrullinated antigens. But so far, for two reasons, I think uh, rheumatoid arthritis has been uh, tough to crack, not through uh, a lack of um, effort, uh, but uh, because uh, there's a whole um, set of nuanced post-translational modifications that we have to think about. And uh, number uh, two, um, homing may not simply be an issue, as I just said, of integrins, but your point's well taken. Uh, the third reason that we may not be making enough progress is that conventional therapies are working so well, so there may be less of a driver to come up with uh, perfection. I see well, that. I, uh, Ashok, if you don't mind, we're going to move on to another question from our okay. good colleague Th and friend. Thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, Paul Strange, who's based in New Jersey, an alumnus of Sanofi and, Copen and uh, Nova Nordis, and a uh, expert in diabetes. So, Paul, uh, you actually wrote your question. Larry, do you see it? Right. Uh, again, it's about to, to what degree do you think uh, tolerization with Tregs uh, might uh, have a uh, specific antigen uh, tolerization? Uh, I think Tregs are a fascinating area. It's certainly under intense investigation. Uh, my only uh, comment is uh, you don't want uh, too much uh, regulation in the way of suppression unless it's antigen specific. Otherwise, as we now know, uh, immune surveillance against cancer is uh, something that uh, is part of our physiology, and we don't want to push regulation so that we get impaired uh, recognition of cancer or impaired uh, immune responses to microbes. But um, it's uh, active, and some of the very uh, most uh, creative and dynamic people are driving the Treg story uh, in type one diabetes, among other diseases, uh, very hard, and they're in the clinic. So let's see what happens. It's all going to be driven by data, uh, efficacy, and safety. It was actually. Paul, more do you want to follow up? Yeah. yeah, I do, because it was actually more a comment on your ant the antigen uh, choice discussion where uh, I would actually argue that it may matter less than people think because uh, once you modulate the immune system, uh, we can call them Tregs or whatever, or, and we can call it the local antigen sensing environment that you are also thinking about. But once uh, you get that tolerization, that tends to be site-specific after homing these uh, T-cells home around. And, it will have, I think personally, that that has a spreading effect to other antigens in that area. So if you do uh, tolerization to pro-insulin, you might actually uh, affect GAD immunity at the same time without doing anything else. So that yep. was what I was asking for your comment on. Right. I, 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 I love agree that. with your comment, though. Yeah, and I, and I, I uh, really resonate uh, with your perspective there. In fact, uh, I've written somewhere, if you email me, I'll send you uh, the reference. We have the concept of antigen specific antigen spreading to different uh, points on the same antigen and to different antigens. There's also, once you start tolerance, there's what I call antigen or epitope specific contraction. So uh, like a wave, it can uh, undulate. And if you are uh, affecting tolerance, you can actually get uh, a diminution in this spreading phenomenon with 
tolerance to neighboring anatomic molecules. So uh, I think we're thinking along the same lines. If the data uh, support it, it's going to be quite exciting. Well, Larry, this has been terrific. I just loved uh, being part of your your presentation, and I know everybody else did as well. If we could applaud, we would do so, or maybe we can't applaud. It won't be uh, maybe heard in our chat room. But um, we're at the top of the hour, and after having that wonderful uh, presentation, we can wish everybody a great weekend.